I have to say I'm incredibly excited about the conversation that's about to happen. I do want to thank Town Hall for its partnership with ISB and bringing good science. And I think this is really terrific science. And let me say a few words about uh, uh, Dr. David Sinclair. Uh, he was born in Australia and transported himself to MIT for a PhD and later to Harvard, where he is now a uh, professor of genetics. David is probably the face of aging in the US and, and, and the world today. The book you heard about, Lifespan, uh, Why You Age and Why You Don't Have To, I think is really one of those transformational books that when you read it, changes how you think about a topic. And I suspect you'll get that feeling tonight from our conversation. David has many academic honors, uh, many beautifully published uh, papers, but it's interesting to note that Time Magazine in, in uh, 2014 uh, declared him one of the most influ 100 influential people in the world, and then in 2018 declared him one of the 50 most influential people uh, in healthcare. And I think in many ways, you'll see from the conversation tonight that that certainly is true. So with that introduction, I'd like to begin our conversation and throw out the first question to David, and that is, you were born in Australia, David. How did you evolve from Australia to become one of the pioneers in aging and longevity? Oh. Well, Lee, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> you know, I've been introduced by a lot of people, but but I think the introduction that you just gave um, was probably the the most uh, uh, important to me because I've had such respect for you even before you know before you even knew who I was. Um, and so, thank you for that, and thanks for the, the opportunity, everybody, for uh, to be able to speak tonight. Um, so, yeah, the. I'm Australian, so I'm I'm I have to be humble. We we in Australia, if we start to boast about ourselves, we'll we'll have no friends. So I will try my best to talk about myself tonight um, as much as you want. Uh, yeah, I was born in Australia. I was a, a pretty normal kid growing up on the edge of the bush. My family had a place with uh, oh about a thousand acres of forest in the backyard. So I spent a lot of time looking at biology. Uh, but I, I always had ambition. I was the kind of kid that. If, if I was born in ancient Greece, I would head to Athens. Um, and so I, I wanted to go where the action was. And it, as nice as Sydney is, it's not the center of the world where I, I like being. Um, I also was raised by my mother and my grandmother. Um, and particularly my grandmother uh, gave me a very special education. She was um, a survivor of World War II and, and realized that, that humanity can do terrible things. She was uh, from Hungary and escaped to Australia with my dad. And so I was raised being told that humanity can do a lot better and that, David, you should spend your life making humanity as best as it can be and as great as it can be because we know humanity can do much better. And, uh, and so I, I, I remember her telling me that. And so I've spent my life really trying to leave the world a better place. Every day I wake up, it's, a, it's another challenge. Uh, to get to the US, really what happened was I realized at the age of 17, 18, as I was entering college, that we're probably the last generation of humans, or at least my generation, uh, to be living a normal human lifespan and that technologies of the future, our kids, our grandkids, would greatly benefit from these, uh, the understanding of why we age. Um, I was also told by my grandmother that everybody eventually gets sick and dies, which to a four-year-old is pretty shocking and we all go through that, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. So combining all of that, Lee, I, I, I set my sights on the US, on Boston, on MIT. I met Lenny Garenti, who became my mentor at MIT. I coincidentally met him in Sydney in 1993. Uh, and I said, I wanna do that. I wanna study aging in yeast cells. And to cut a long story short, um, a famous scientist, Doug Melton, interviewed me for a fellowship for a Helen Hay Whitney Fellowship. They'd never given it to a foreigner before. 
Uh, and I just argued that they should give it to me anyway. And they did. And the rest is, I guess, history. Well, terrific, David. One of the most interesting aspects of your book was in early in the book, the delineation of the information theory of aging. And I say that because I think from that conceptually comes absolutely fascinating hypotheses. So can you explain simply in, in mm. uh, it, layman terms, just what that means? Mm. And I'll say it's also interesting because you made the fascinating point that aging is easier to deal with than cancer is. And this all comes out of the information theory of aging. That's right. Yeah. So the, I've been studying aging since I was at MIT. This is now 1995. And the first set of genes that we were working on in Lenny's lab came out of a, a random screen for any gene that would make a yeast cell more stress resistant and longer lived. And out of that came the discovery that there are certain genes, which we now call sirtuins. They didn't have that name in the beginning. But the interesting thing about the name is that the SIR in the name stands for Silent Information Regulator. And at the time, we really had no idea why a silent information regulator, in other words, something that controls the expression of other genes, turning other genes off, why would that be controlling aging? At the time, the idea was that, and still for the most part, is that just things break down and there's not much you can do about it. You could try to slow it down, but we're basically all going to fade away and, and, and be corrupted and degenerate. But that information part of that, that um, acronym is very important. And so I've been focusing on what is it about information that's relevant to aging. And um, we did a lot of work in yeast and then in mammals in my lab at Harvard. And so I've always been trying to think about information. And the, one of the breakthroughs came when um, I realized uh, I was reading about information theory. Uh, Claude Shannon, um, a big disciple of his, and he's a professor from MIT in the 1940s. And he came up with the mathematics of information preservation. Uh, and actually his mathematics led to the internet among other things. And his idea was that, that things degenerate over time, including signals such as radio signals because of, intro of introduced noise. And that really clicked with me. I, I could see that we, were, we could be the biological equivalent of a radio signal that degenerates and has in, introduced noise. Uh, and it fit with most of the work that was being done in my lab, uh, if not all of it. And so I came up with the information theory of aging, as I call it. And really the idea is that uh, we are born with a relatively pristine set of information. Our DNA is a digital code four bases, four letters, instead of digital zeros and ones, but nevertheless, it's digital. Uh, but there's another type of information that's just as important for our survival, and that's called the epigenome that controls how the DNA is expressed. In other words, which genes are on and off. And you need that because the brain has a different set of genes required for a liver cell and a skin cell. And that's what the epigenome does. And the analogy is, um, excuse the, the old, um, the old fashionedness, but a DVD or a compact disc has digital information, but the reader, which is the, the head that moves and uses the laser is analog. And the cell, cells have two types. They have the DNA and then they have the, the reader. And it seemed to me that everything we were learning was that the readers, the readers of the DNA and the control systems uh, were going awry during aging. And that led to the, the realization, if that was true, then here's the really interesting corollary is that there might be a backup copy of, of the original information, the genetic information and even the epigenetic information. And we published a paper in December that uh, we were pretty excited to even receive the cover of that issue that said that we could actually tap into a backup copy of the original epigenetic information in a cell or in a tissue. In this case, we rejuvenated the eye of mice and made them able to see again after suffering from glaucoma or just being old. And so what I, I think is this could be a turning point, you know, dare, dare I say it at risk of being wrong, but if I'm right, then there really is the ability of truly not just slowing aging, but resetting the body to an earlier age and aging out multiple times and resetting multiple times. Yeah. Well, I think the really important conclusion from that uh, experience was 
there, there are actually two aspects to aging, it seems to me. One is, can we slow it down? And the second is, can we reverse it? And it's never been shown to be reversible before. I think you're, the paper that you described was one of the very first. And I think a fascinating question is, how far can we reverse it? And, and, and another interrelated question, I'll leave you with these two, is when should we start thinking about aging and actually doing things which will slow or even begin to reverse the process? Right. right. Well, like all science, I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulder, shoulder of giants. There are giants that figured out that you can reset the age of, of somatic adult cells to be zero. So John Gordon and Shinya Yamanaka did those experiments in tadpoles and in skin cells respectively, and won the Nobel Prize deservedly in, uh, what was it 2012, I think. Uh, so that, that was part of the initiative of reversing aging, but we needed to do that. We needed to reset the age of cells, not to zero, but by 50 or 75% without causing the cells to become tumors. Mm -hmm. And that was the challenge. We spent, oh, about three years trying different genetic combinations, trying genes that come on in embryos, trying genes that, that are helpful to cancers, but not causing cancer. And finally hit upon a three gene combination that resets the age of the cell by about 75%. And you might say, well, how do you know how old a cell is? Well, we actually now have a very accurate way of measuring the age of a cell or of the body. Uh, some people call it the Horvath clock. It's also known as the DNA methylation clock. We can read the chemicals that change over time that are on the DNA called methyls. And that gives us a really accurate measure of age. And so we could now take those mice that had restored vision and truly ask, are those cells just acting young or are they literally young? And the answer was they are literally young again. And that was the first, I think the first discovery that in an, a living organism, you could safely reprogram and reset the age of the body. Um, how soon is this available to humans? Well, we're working towards doing our first clinical trial in the next couple of years. We've already got two years of work under our belt there. Wow. Yeah. Um, but what about other parts of the body? I, I think that it's going to be possible to reset most parts of the body. The question is, uh, you know, the safety issue, of course, but my lab has now uh, had some early results resetting other parts of the body. Um, muscle is looking promising. We've got other labs doing the brain. Actually, we've got some early results with Alzheimer's disease and old age dementia. Uh, and there's another lab at Stanford. I should shout out Sebastiano's lab and at Salk Institute, I should credit um, Juan Carlos Belmonte for showing that uh, you can reverse the age of cells that you take out of a mouse and put them back in. And, uh, and that is also beneficial. So you don't just have to reprogram cells that are in existence. Ultimately, where is this going? Well, it'd be like asking the Wright brothers, how soon do we get to Mars? It's, it's doable, I just don't know when, but I can see now if the information theory of aging is correct, Lee, that we will, be able to one day uh, perhaps have an injection of a, of a virus that carries these reprogramming genes and turn them on with an antibiotic. In the mm -hmm. mice, we use doxycycline. It's a pretty inert drug. And turn on these genes for, for four to six weeks, reverse the age of the body. And then, then your doctor will say, come back in another decade, we'll do another treatment. Yeah, yeah. So you, in your book, discuss longevity genes. Do you want to describe what this does and their role in this information theory of aging? Yeah, they, these are fascinating genes. They came mostly out of the 1990s and early 2000s discoveries in yeast and worms and flies, uh, labs like Cynthia Kenyon, Gary Rovkin, Lenny Garanti, of course, where I was. And uh, these are genes that you might not suspect are actually controlling aging, but were discovered through just looking across the genomes of these organisms. And what we've discovered is that they do is that they're, they're built for survival. They're not built for, for longevity, but what they do is they respond to when organisms are perceiving adversity or future adversity. For instance, in yeast, we showed in a nature paper 2003 that if you restrict the amount of calories that a yeast cell gets or raise the temperature or give it a little bit too much salt or lack amino acids, it'll live longer through a set of longevity genes, these sirtuins I alluded to, 
And that is a defense response trying to survive. And so you can think of longevity genes in that way. These are like the Pentagon that you can call up and say, there's an emergency, send out the troops, even if there isn't an emergency. And that's what our bodies are actually doing when we exercise and we go hungry, we're making a call to the, our body's Pentagon to send out the repair troops. And if you do that routinely, you're going to have longer life. This is what has been shown time and time again. The question is, when should you start? Well, we're, we're starting to age from actually even before we're born, this clock is ticking. So even if, even if you look in the mirror and you don't have wrinkles yet, trust me, you are getting older um, and you're heading towards you know, decrepitude. So I, I'm not saying to, to you know, have intermittent fasting if you're a teenager or a young adult, you've got a lot of activity for your longevity genes. But for me, by the time I hit my thirties, you know, I was already feeling like uh, you know, I needed something to assist me. And uh, so that's when I started. But um, so that there are two answers. It's, it's good to start early, the animal studies suggest and or actually show, but it's also, I wouldn't say it's never too late, but it's, you can start late. We can intervene in a mouse that's equivalent of a 70 year old and have a lifespan extension at 15 or more percent. So it's in that, in that window, but I wouldn't go too old. I don't think once you're hundred years old, you're going to go back to 20 uh, unless our science improves. So the, the, how do the longevity genes then relate to these, these now classic nine hallmarks of aging? Again, that seems that whole process is a part of this simplicity we spoke about that marks aging as a contrast with something more complicated like cancer. Right. So yeah, cancer has been described as a hundred different diseases. Aging is, is really just a, in my view, a, a relatively simple process. Um, there are three levels. We've got the environment and what we eat and how we live. So this is external and, and internal inputs. And I've already mentioned that putting yourself in a state of adversity, walking, not eating, this kind of stuff does that. Second layer are the longevity genes that sense that adversity uh, and uh, control the systems below it. So what's below that at the very fundamental level? Well, of course, there's the epigenome, which I've explained is you know, my... my best theory so far to explain the fundamental causes, but tied up with that, perhaps influenced, if not controlled by the epigenetic changes are what you mentioned, which are the hallmarks of aging. You, many um, viewers will remember uh, telomere loss, the ends of chromosomes get shorter. We, have, we lose stem cells. We have senescent cells, the zombie cells that accumulate in the body to make us old. These, about 10 years ago, we, we in the field agreed on nine hallmarks that contribute to aging primarily. And uh, what they do is that they control the troops. They are the various divisions in the Pentagon that go out, there's the army, the Navy, the Air Force, Space Force. Um, that's what these, whole, these, these longevity genes will control. Now, what I don't know yet, but what's exciting is that maybe if we can reset the age of the cell through the epigenome, these other hallmarks of aging will vanish. Uh, and we have some evidence that some of them do actually go away, meaning that the information theory is you know, perhaps valid. But that, that doesn't mean that we're just going to be able to, I think, just tackle the epigenome. These other things need to be addressed. And so there are many researchers and companies working towards finding ways to address each of the individual hallmarks as well. Yeah. So... You spoke about the environment being the higher level that starts the whole chain of, of uh, the aging process. What are the environmental manipulations that we can use to influence the hallmarks of aging that ordinary people like you and me can actually incorporate into the way we live? Yeah. Well, it's not that hard to live another 14 years uh, on average. If you just do the right things, which is don't become obese, do some exercise, eat good food. Um, what are the other ones? I think it's get sleep and uh, and don't stress. That the, the the basic stuff. That that in itself will give you fourteen years. Um, it's been calculated. Uh, you know, bad luck notwithstanding. But you can go beyond that. That's just that's just the minimal. 
If I could recommend one thing for people to try, uh, it would be to eat less often. You know, I, I've totally changed my life about around this. So is my father, who's 81, without any any medical issues at all. Uh, we we now eat uh, one meal a day. I might have a bit of lunch, but not much, um, and the rest is just warm drinks, which I love anyway. Um, there are some really good experiments that show in many different species, and we've known this for 80 years, that reducing the amount of calorie intake, particularly if you restrict it during certain times of the day, it's beneficial. One of the best experiments I could point to, or it's, it's a set of experiments, is by Rafael de Cabo at the NIA, which is the National Institute on Aging in Bethesda. And he did a very interesting set of experiments in mice, admittedly, but it was really telling. He was trying to figure out what are the differences between diets and you can give mice more calories in the form of fat or protein or carbohydrate. And he did all those combinations, 10,000 mice, but he did something also interesting, which was fed the mice either all during the night when they typically eat called ad libitum feeding or only at for a little window during the day or during the night, I should say. And the mice ate almost the same amount of food because you can imagine if you're a hungry mouse, you're gonna gobble it down really quickly within that hour of feeding. The only ones that lived longer were the ones that had the restricted time restricted feeding. It didn't matter what they were eating. So what that tells me most likely, and there's epidemiological evidence, this is true in humans, that it's not as important about what you eat you know, of course, you, you can't eat a terribly horrible diet and expect to live longer, but within reason, it's more important when and how often you eat. And so that's what I do. I, I've really cut back. I've in the lot during COVID, I've lost no, what is it? Nine kilos. What's that? It's a lot of pounds. I'm, I'm down to the weight that I was when I was 20 now. And I feel great. Um, there are plenty of other things you should be doing. Lifting weights, especially if you're a male, an older male, keeping up the muscle strength, but even for women, keep your muscles toned because falling over is the quickest way to dying actually. is Somebody in the US falls over every 19 seconds and breaks their leg or their hip. And that's that's you know, eventually fatal for most yeah. elderly yeah. people. So a, a really interesting question. I mean, uh, intermittent dieting, intermittent fasting, is presumably stressing the body and it activates longevity genes and sets in place this whole anti-aging process. So my question to you, it seems to me the most challenging aspect of that is how do you persuade people to change their behavior and adopt activities that are really good for them in the long term? I mean, that is... That's I'm very interested yeah. in wellness. Yeah. I and, know and you the are. the issue is yeah. exactly the same there. So I'd be curious about your thoughts on how can we get people to change? Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, you and I, we, we've talked about this, and it's really difficult. What, what I find is helpful is information. Uh, and even thinking about my own life, if I didn't get any feedback, positive or negative, I, I gave up. Right. You, you step on the scales, but that's about it. Once you start measuring things and, and getting feedback, uh, I find it makes the world of difference. Um, you know, not everyone does this, but I wear an, a, an aura ring for sleep and motion. I, um, I monitor um, my blood work as well, just to know what's happening. So that the, that's the future so that people won't just go for an annual checkup. They'll actually be constantly seeing when they, they did this or they took that supplement if things are working. Now that's that's still futuristic. We still have you know, close to 50% of the US overweight. So how do you reach those people? Um, it's really hard. I mean, it's one of the reasons I wrote my book uh, is to hopefully reach more people and make uh, those people that hear or read my book realize that 80% of our longevity and our health in old age is based on how we live and only 20% is genetic. So you really can control how long and how healthy you are in old age. Um, so there's the education part, there's the feedback, positive feedback, hopefully. Um, but other than that, I'd, Lee, I'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are on how to have people more interested in this. 
Well, I would agree with you. I think I think there are two really important aspects. One is you have to give people a metric that show they're succeeding or failing, and the metric can show they can change their behavior. And I think being able to measure something like biological age, the age your body says you are, as opposed to your birthday, I think is one of the most valuable tools we're going to have in convincing people that this is a unique opportunity. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? I'd love to. Uh, Yeah, so we've been working behind the scenes in my lab on trying to democratize that test. Now that test, if you haven't heard of it, I mentioned it earlier, it's the Horvath clock, typically it's called. What we can measure are the chemical changes on the DNA itself in, in blood or in a cheek swab. And that will quite accurately tell you your, your real age, not your birthday candles. Uh, I like to joke that, I mean, who cares how many times the earth has gone around the sun? That's not what's determining your health. It's really more about your true biological age. And so in my lab, we've we've been able to develop new technologies to be able to read that test. And you know, I'll, I'll say publicly for the first time that we're planning on uh, making this commercially available to the public because I think it's so important that uh, everyone who wants this test should have a cheap uh, way to do that. And I totally agree. It changes your mindset when you can really measure how well you're doing um, and also see if you can improve it. I'll, I'll tell you the second thing, David, I think is really important is education at the K through 12 level. So for example, ISB is putting together a program on health where we have 20 units that are based on this vision of uh, uh, a health that's predictive and preventive and personalized and participatory. And one of those units is going to be on aging. And wouldn't it be wonderful if all high school seniors came out of uh, school with an understanding uh, of the kinds of things we're talking about now? And for young people, it's easy to change. For a lot of things in older people, the easiest way to get them to change is to have them die off and let their kids change. So anyway... But I think education and I think metrics are, but you know, there, there is a third really interesting opportunity I'd love you to talk about. And that is, you know, Americans really like the idea. No, I mean, your big new idea is that age, aging is really a disease. And we know how we can deal with the disease. And the way Americans like to deal with disease is with pills. So do you want to talk about pills and aging and where that's going in the future? Yeah, it's a it's a really hot area right now. Um, going back when I started my first company, 19, no, 2004, uh, it was crazy to think that you could develop a medicine that would tackle the root causes of aging or slow it down. And people didn't even understand how to think about it, let alone... Uh, uh, build companies out of it. Uh, I think we, we, we showed that it was possible. Um, and we're now in a world actually where longevity research and longevity development of drugs, uh, development of longevity drugs uh, is one of the hottest areas in, in biotechnology. Um, you know, I sit in, in the center of a, a tornado of activity and I see that it's really gone almost vertical uh, in, in a graph of interest of investors, um, I, I'm part of a group actually that that uh, recently said we were going to invest in a company related to longevity. We haven't picked out which company yet, um, and there was a billion dollars of interest. So this is we're in a, a it's a zeitgeist. In other words, that I think the science has reached a point where uh, Wall Street um, and hopefully Main Street increasingly has realized that the science has come of age and that we can truly develop medicines that will use this knowledge, uh, not only to treat aging, but to treat the effects of aging. And actually 85% of of all suffering on the planet, uh, including most major diseases, are due to aging. We're in denial that aging is is not important, but actually it's far more important for lung cancer 
than smoking is, for example, by, by at least an order of magnitude. So this is a major issue, but I'm, I'm optimistic now that we've seemingly turned a corner uh, similar to, yeah, I use the Wright brothers as a good example. And, you know, we're talking, we're now in the 1920s where people have seen that the Wright flyer works and there's a lot of interest in building, you know, eventually a, a Boeing 747. You know, I think one of the most exciting ideas I extracted from your book was this idea that aging is the dominant cause of virtually all chronic diseases. Let's say you can control aging. Then we can begin to think about controlling all these diseases. So the argument is, why don't we spend the six or seven billion dollars on cancer in the 11 billion on whatever else. Mm -hmm. Why don't we spend it on figuring out how to control aging? Wouldn't that be more efficient than mm -hmm. taking diseases one at a time? It's, a, it's, as I would say, a systems integrative global approach and very powerful and one you're advocating. Right. Well, what I wrote in my book, I still believe, which is uh, I'm not going to try to rub Peter to pay Paul. Um, I think that all medical research is important and there isn't enough of the funding. Um, the amount of money we spend on aging research, though, if you just look at the biology of aging, um, and if you don't include Alzheimer's and other things, which are sometimes included unfairly, I think, um, it's really just a few fighter jets in the US is spent on this. You know? And so I would say that as a country, the US can afford to put more money into understanding the biology of aging, even without robbing, uh, or not robbing, but taking from other places. But I, I definitely agree with you that the impact of, of this could be far greater than tackling one disease at a time. One of the problems with the approach that we have right now is that we've been effective at treating some areas of aging, such as heart disease. We've got the statins for, for cholesterol. We've got very good uh, blood pressure lowering medicines. And so we're, we're generally living longer because of that, but the brain still ages. And now we're, there's an increase in dementias. And that's the wrong way to approach medicine. I would rather try to keep all parts of the body younger and healthier for longer and have an extension of our health span rather than just our lifespan. Yeah. Well, look, this discussion really brings us to a fascinating point you and I have discussed before. And that is our determination to push forward in the vision we have, your vision for aging and so forth. So my question is to you, where do we go beyond government funding to get the resources to be able to do the science that really is going to transform aging? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I've seen a lot more interest from philanthropists um, and, um, and nonprofit organizations. So I think that that's, that's an area where people can make a big difference. Yep. Uh, George Church and I talk a lot about this. Um, just for a couple of million dollars, you can have a big impact in a lab. You can develop basically a, a drug that's almost ready to go into humans if you're very um, efficient with capital. Um, and often people who have the wealth to, to fund these kind of things are shocked that such a relatively small amount can have such a big difference, but it really can. At the early stages, discoveries can be made just by a graduate student who's yep. staying up at night yep. dreaming. And this is what changes the planet, not the billion dollars of investment at the late stage of technology. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think another approach that you and I share is this idea we can take useful knowledge and spin it off to companies which can generate enormous resources for the maturation of the ideas. And that amplifies enormously the kinds of things that you can get done. And you've certainly been very successful in, in taking that approach as well. Oh, thanks. Um, you know, I, I have a few uh, idols uh, in your one of them, Lee. Uh, I'm not kidding. It was very difficult as a, as a young scientist in my 30s at Harvard uh, spinning out companies it, in the 1990s, especially in 1990s and even in the 2000s, it was just not something that assistant professors did. Right? You, how how could you do that? Let alone go in the media and talk directly to the public. That was totally frowned upon. 
um, I, I look to people like you as inspiration um, and to give me the courage to do that. And I'm, I'm so glad I did. And fortunately, now we live in a world where um, it's quite acceptable it's pretty for common. us to yeah. do that. But it wasn't always the case. And you were doing it before me and you had the courage to do that. And I assume it's because you didn't want to just publish papers. You wanted to change the world. And that's where we both are, I think. So one of the things that's utterly necessary for changing the world is convincing the CEOs at every level, healthcare, uh, industry, uh, the, the high level people in government of the validity of the vision. And do you have ideas about how to do, because that is one of the most challenging, if you can get to leaders, you can change organizations. But getting to leaders and changing their thinking is enormously challenging. Yet there, there are approaches one can use, obviously. Yeah. So there are, there are leaders in industry, there are leaders in government, uh, leaders in regulatory authorities, such as the FDA. And I think we have to talk to all of them. And I, you and I have been doing that. Um, actually, in, in my estimation, I haven't been that good at it. It's been quite difficult to change the world from the top down. I, I'm, I'm actually having better success from the bottom up. But I, I do think we have to take both approaches to be both approaches, more yeah. successful. Yeah. yeah. And, and the FDA, surprisingly, a few years ago, said that they were open to calling aging a treatable disorder if we could just prove that it was. Um, and that those experiments are actually ongoing with a drug called metformin, which many of you will have heard of. It's a frontline diabetes, type 2 diabetes drug for the elderly and people who have high blood sugar. And that drug seems, at least based on tens of thousands of patients who've taken that drug, uh, had protection not just against their blood sugar, but also cancer and uh, heart disease and even Alzheimer's uh, frailty for sure. And so this could already be a drug for longevity that's that's available. It's very cheap. It's probably a few cents per pill. It's available over the counter in many countries, not here in the US, unfortunately. Um, but if the FDA allowed doctors to prescribe metformin before you had type, had type 2 diabetes, that would be revolutionary. This would be the equivalent of having um, the statins for heart disease or blood pressure medicine. Um, yeah. the, this would yeah. be a massive change. But right now, doctors are most doctors are either ignorant or reticent to prescribe such a medicine that would prevent multiple diseases. How, how would you categorize rapamycin in that regard? Another drug that is, uh, it manipulates a major one of these central systems to yeah. set up the defense that leads to uh, yeah. reducing aging. Yeah. Well, so what you said really resonated earlier, which is that you and I believe, well, I certainly believe, I think you believe that, that aging is simpler and easier to treat than cancer, which is a bunch of different diseases. When it comes down to it, aging is not that complicated. Yes, the effects downstream and all of the various um, things you see in old people, older people are complicated, but at the, the core of what's controlling all of that are really just three main uh, systems that we've discovered. There may be a few more, but we know of three. One is the sirtuins that I work on. Another is called AMPK or AMP kinase, which metformin works on. And now Lee, you've brought up the third leg of the stool, which is a, a protein complex that senses amino acid intake called mTOR. Um, and so mTOR, which is little m, capital T-O-R, uh, if you eat a, a steak that's full of leucine, isoleucine, valine, it, this protein complex will sense that and say, oh, times are good. We just killed a mammoth. Let's build you know, more, more skin. Let's make more Let's whatever. reproduce. Yeah. Exactly. Let's <laughs> reproduce. But there's a trade-off. The trade-off is that this, the body shuts down its defenses, such as recycling proteins called autophagy, a very important hallmark of aging that declines with time. And so by taking this drug rapamycin, which is definitively shown to, um, or selectively shown, or shown to selectively target mTOR, uh, which is used actually to modulate the immune system, it's 
Uh, in low doses, it looks really promising as a longevity molecule. In rodents, it's, it's probably the most successful molecule for extending lifespan, even late in life. The problem with rapamycin, the way it turns out, uh, is that if you take doses uh, that are high, I think higher than 10 milligrams for a long time, it can damage kidneys among other things. So it's not a perfectly safe drug, which you'd want uh, for something that you'd use for longevity. That said, uh, rapamycin taken once a week uh, or in low doses, three milligrams, are, are things that people are talking about. Um, and I'm aware of people who are trying it. Um, you might say, well, why would you try something if it's not proven to work? Well, if we wait till it's all proven to work, you know, a lot of people listening to this and watching will be dead. So there, there's a risk reward ratio um, calculation that goes on in people's minds. And that it's all done under doctor supervision because it's a prescribed medicine. Um, but we're at, actually at that turning point, I think in human history where uh, we are able to say that there's a pretty good likelihood that some medicines that are already approved uh, could affect the aging process in a positive right. way. Right. Well, you know, one thing we promise to have a conversation with one another about it in the future is my idea, if we can measure in patients uh, enormous amounts of data that assay all the major systems and everything, in clinical trials like we're talking about with aging, we can one, reduce the number of patients that give you compelling results, mm -hmm. and two, we can see results much more quickly because we're looking at many more features to see if there are subtle changes and so forth. And it seems to me this is going to be a really key part for accelerating the acceptance of some of the kinds of things that we've talked about here. So my last question, because we've got to turn to the audience now, is if you had to prioritize for the audience things that they could do now, what would be your priority list for them to uh, live in a healthy aging manner? Right. Well, I've mentioned uh, eat less often. I think the three meals a day plus snacks is misguided. And I'm happy to debate nutritionists on that. Uh, other things you can do is make sure that you keep your muscle mass. We lose a percent or so. Uh, every year as older males, uh, females too as well. Females have to particularly watch about watch their bone loss as well. So doing exercise. Whether so it's so really is the exercise primarily to keep up muscle mass or does it do other things too? Oh, it does lots of good things. Some of which I'm not even going to mention, but um, testosterone will go way up uh, if you build up the big muscles in your body. So I exercise my quads. So my leg muscles, my back muscles are the main ones. You know, the, the, the rest is just probably... Uh, mostly just for vanity. But um, the big muscles are really important. Uh, in males and females, if, if you have strong hips um, and there's a piriformis muscle, which holds your hips, basically your legs together. The problem with current lifestyle is that sitting all the time causes those muscles to degenerate. And it's very easy to, um, to just be weak there. And most people don't realize they're weak. One of the things, you know, I'll get back to the question, Lee, in a second, but there, there's an easy way to tell how old you are, roughly. It's called the sitting standing test, and it'll test these muscles. You sit cross-legged, and if you can get up without touching the floor with your hands and stand up, you're young. A middle-aged person like me might need to use a hand to get up, and an, an elderly person will have to get on one knee to get up. And that's really just testing your muscle strength. I think doing 20 push-ups is considered really good at my age, too. But those are not very accurate compared to the, the other things we talked about. Um, but you're, you're right that d making your muscles stronger has multiple benefits. It's increased uh, testosterone for males and uh, to lesser extent females. The muscles give out, give out hormones that are beneficial. There are what you know, Leah, called myokines, which uh, we think circulate throughout the body and provide uh, improved health as well. Mm -hmm. We don't know all mm -hmm. of them, but we know some of them. The other thing that muscle strength and aerobic exercise in particular will do is it'll make sure that blood glucose levels don't get high in your body. And when you eat a meal, the levels of sugar in your blood don't spike. Um, and, and having high blood glu glucose levels is, the, is one of the rapid ways to, to suffering and death. 
anyone who's had type two diabetes in a bad way will tell you that, um, including lack of circulation, heart disease, et cetera, and dementia. Yeah. yeah. So that there's all those benefits um, besides just feeling great and being able to still walk in old age and make sure that if you fall over, you'll bounce back up. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, with that, I'll start reading some questions from the chat box that the audience has asked. So uh, the first is, when do you plan to have the Horvath clock test available for consumers? Oh, that's hilarious. Um, uh, only because that, that, that's one of the questions that somebody was just asking me before I got on. Um, all right. So this is public information. So let me think what I can say. We are right in the process of making that happen. Uh, the test uh, will be coming down a lot in price. And I mean, I, I hope to be able to have something available, uh, conservatively speaking, before the end of this year. Um, yeah, that's probably all I should say at this point, but it is coming. And it'll be, it'll be backed by my science, it'll be backed by my reputation. It'll also provide feedback and suggestions on how to improve your score. Well, you know, I will make uh, one comment on a, I guess, competitor now called Longevity that <laughs> has a test for biological age yeah. that uses blood analytes. Yeah. And again, right. it is now available. So you can look up uh, longevity and, and read about that. But I think both possibilities are absolutely fascinating. Second question, what is the ideal window for eating with intermittent fasting? You eat just a single meal. Does that mean the window is just one to two hours of eating per day? Not even that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like everybody. Uh, I'm a regular person. I like eating cheesecake, you know, but, but what I've realized is that I feel so much better. I'm more alert. I'm excited. I'm, I have a better outlook. I'm optimistic. If I don't constantly eat, um, I've never been big on breakfast. So that's just my physiology. Some people need breakfast. I don't. Uh, but I, then I started skipping lunch and having a hot tea instead. I might, you know, eat a piece of fruit, but that's about it. And then at dinner time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll look at a dinner. If I go out to dinner socially, I'll just eat normally. That's fine. I'm not going to reduce my joy in life. But most dinners are small. They are more like what a rabbit would eat than a lion. Um, I eat fish. Uh, I try not to eat big steaks. But generally, I've reduced the portion sizes really way down. Um, and, you know, I've never felt better. I, you know, I boasted probably a little too much that I've got my 20-year-old body back. But I really do. And it's it's invigorating to be like this. And it wasn't that hard. I really started in, in earnest in February. And, you know, we're now in April. It wasn't that hard. Um, I hope that everybody can consider it uh, if they are not already doing it. Um, I would encourage you to, to do it for at least two weeks before you give up because it takes two weeks to get used to it. You know, we've all got habits. We go to the fridge, we eat snacks. And once you get over that psychological thing, just have warm drinks, hot water, tea, whatever you feel like, then it's easy. I definitely don't feel hungry. In fact, I feel way better uh, not uh, having all these meals. One question I get though is should I, should I fast longer than 18 hours, which is what I tend to go for? And you, you can do that. I'm not that good at it actually. I'm, I don't have a lot of willpower to be honest. A lot of people are better than me. So some people go for three days. Um, maybe every few weeks. If you go for three days, you get real deep cleansing by this process called autophagy. The body will start to recycle more proteins than it normally would using a, a system called uh, chaperone mediated autophagy or CMA. Uh, I would love to try three days. I just haven't been able to do that yet. And then there's the extreme version, which is um, a colleague of ours, Peter, Dr. Peter Atia, who's uh, become pretty well known for this. He does a week of fasting uh, just with water. And he does that, I think, every every few months, and uh, and apparently that that's extremely um, good for you, according to his um, estimations. But it's hard to do. I would say at least try not to eat three meals a day. That's a good start. 
And then if you can get to one, that's even better. So yeah, you you really do start to appreciate food. That's for sure. Yes. But, it, but it doesn't dominate your life. I, I lived a childhood where my mother used every meal to discuss what was for the next meal. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty happy that I don't live like that anymore. Great. So in your book, you write about uh, Reserveritol, uh, NMN, and other supplements. What does the latest research say about these? Would you give advice to people that are, what advice would you give to people interested in adopting them? All right. Uh, so the technology in my lab has been improving uh, steadily. Uh, resveratrol was a very early discovery back into the early 2000s. What we were trying to understand was, can you activate these longevity pathways, mechanisms with a safe molecule? And at the time we didn't know that. Now it seems obvious, of course, because everyone's talking about it, but we didn't know. And so what we discovered, co-discovered with my co-authors was that plant polyphenols, these are a variety of molecules that are made by plants when they're also under adversity. Uh, and one of which is resveratrol, which is found in grapevines and red wine, uh, was pretty effective at activating one of the sirtuin enzymes that uh, my lab and others has shown to be beneficial for health in, in mammals and even in humans. So resveratrol got a lot of, of hype, actually. It was kind of unavoidable. Uh, there were a couple of things going on. The red wine industry loved it. Sales of red wine went up 30 plus percent and have stayed up. Um, and then there was the commercial entity. So I started a company called Sertris, which, you know, had a professional team of people talking to the media. So all of that, you know, 60 Minutes, Barbara Walters interview, all that was pretty fun. Um, but what really came out of it was the realization that a safe small molecule could be used to um, mimic the benefits of fasting. So we fed resveratrol to mice that were on a high fat Western diet. And they lived as long and were just as healthy as the mice uh, that were lean. So that, that in itself was, I think, a, a radical um, departure from what people were thinking. Would I take resveratrol? Well, I, I do still take resveratrol. I just take a, a teaspoonful of it uh, every morning. Um, I take it with a tiny bit of yogurt just because it needs to dissolve. It's like brick dust. Otherwise, it doesn't dissolve. Um, and I've been doing that since my 30s, and I'm still alive. Uh, so it's we don't know if it's going to make me live longer. But you're, you're the good um, test subject, yes. Well, I'm an Australian, so as you know, that there's a tradition of Australian scientists experimenting on themselves, like Barry Marshall discovered. Oh yeah, yeah. That, uh, that the the ulcers in the stomach are caused by bacteria. He actually drank the bacteria yep. and caused himself, yep. and then cured himself. So I, I but he won question. a Nobel Prize, so sometimes it works. Yeah, well, instead of waiting 30 years for the clinical evidence, yeah. but, you know, I'm, I'm not doing this to try and live forever. I, I don't really worry about that, but I am very curious and I, I do like to learn things quickly. My father's been on resveratrol for the same amount of time. And as I mentioned, he's 81 and, and is as fit or fitter than I am. Um, but I don't, I don't recommend supplements. I, I, I'm not a, an MD and we don't know if these are gonna work, but there is a lot of evidence I would say in animal studies that resveratrol uh, is relatively benign um, and also can be beneficial to your metabolism um, and protecting the organs. So I, I continue to take it until I see evidence that it could be dangerous. And I haven't seen anything like that in 20 years. Um, I do take another molecule that's fairly prominent in the media, uh, which is called an NAD booster. Um, you can buy these, they're called either NR or NMN. I, I certainly don't sell anything at all. I don't promote anything, but I find that a lot of people are interested in it. So I'm mentioning it tonight. NAD boosters are came out of research out of my lab, as well as Lenny Garenti's. We discovered that the sirtuin enzymes um, are controlled by the level of NAD. This is a molecule that our bodies make for metabolic reactions, but also control the sirtuins activity. Uh, and when you're hungry, if you're a yeast cell or a human, your levels of NAD will rise. And, but as you get older, it declines. And so what we, we're trying to do is to artificially boost up the levels of NAD in the body. And that's why I take the molecule called NMN, which is a precursor to NAD. Um, interestingly, and what's very rarely recognized is that 
uh, one of the companies that I founded, co-founded, called Metro Biotech, has been doing clinical trials in people for over two years now uh, with an NAD-boosting molecule that is related to NMN and found you know, really great results so far. I'm not at liberty to say what they are yet, but you know, I'm, I'm still taking NMN having seen all the data. But I, I don't want anyone to get the impression that I'm a, a cowboy who's just experimenting on himself. It's not that, you know, I, I only take very calculated, uh, you know, barely risks, but I also at the same time do clinical trials on these molecules to try and rapidly find out, A, are they safe and B, are they effective? Okay, I love this question. Is it totally a good thing to get younger? Wouldn't that overpopulate the world with a bunch of newly young people? Uh, well, so I, I don't think that the world is a pie that has only a certain number of slices. Um, I think we can keep growing the pie. Now the world has limited resources, of course. We can't keep burning oil and we can't keep overpopulating. We're continuing to populate. Uh, growing in population. But um, as I explained in the last part of my book, when you actually do the math, um, and I, I've, I'm, we're actually going to publish uh, a mathematical model in the journal uh, Nature Aging soon on this. What happens is it, it doesn't, if you stop aging or slow it down, certainly if you slow it down, it doesn't appreciably contribute to global population, despite what you might think. There aren't that many people dying from old age, actually. It's, the problem is birth. And fortunately, fertility rates, or at least reproductive um, numbers in families is steadily declining across the planet and is even in the negative for most developing country, or developed countries. The US would go negative if it didn't have immigration. So don't worry. I don't think you should worry about population. World resources, yeah, we need to solve that. But I'm hugely encouraged by for instance, the energy transition to renewable resources. I drive a Tesla for good reason. And I think that humans are capable of engineering themselves and innovating themselves out of really any problem. It's just a matter of will and the investment and we can solve any problem. I think the other point is to be younger means you're vital, energetic, curious, creative, uh, I mean, uh, it's hard to believe that virtually anybody wouldn't like those, those traits. Another question, if someone were interested in a career changing into a field of aging from a business-related field, where would you recommend starting? Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, start if, if you're in high school, have a great interest in science. Um, you want mathematics, you want a bit of physics, you want chemistry, you want biology. Uh, when you get to college, I would uh, do some basic biology. I would do some philosophy. I would do some history if you're interested. Get a broad education. It'll help you greatly in the rest of your life. Um, and when you get to my age, it's, it's very difficult to, to do those kind of broad thinking uh, and learning. So do that, but then start to focus um, maybe in your second, third year on genetics, which now covers molecular biology, as well as you know, even nanotechnology kind of stuff that Lee has developed in his career. We're now in, in, a, in a revolution, both in our ability to read and write the genome, to read and write the epigenome, um, and to, to do experiments by the millions per day, uh, just as, as one person. Uh, something that took me a whole PhD, which was to discover three genes and read the read the code, uh, can now be done. Well, it, it wouldn't even be done. It would, the whole genome can be done in an in an hour by a graduate student of of a yeast cell. So we're at a point where um, it's a great time to join uh, molecular biology and genetics and and uh, and science in general because we've got these tools that people like Lee have built for us that we can now do a million experiments a day. So I, that's a long way of saying also get some experience in bioinformatics because being able to analyze all of that data is invaluable. And I cannot find enough good bioinformaticians at this point. Yep, absolutely. Presumably you currently do your own sequencing for your methylase and age calculations. Is this the kind of thing somebody could do themselves today on a regular basis with their own DNA sequencer? 
Uh, who has their own DNA sequencer, for goodness sakes? Um, if you had a DNA sequencer- Well, on- with Olink, you can actually have a little DNA sequencer that doesn't cost, I mean, with, uh, with the single cell sequencing technology from England. Yeah. yeah. Minion, you mean? Or is this something yeah. else? Yeah, the Minion, that's right. Yeah. Right, a little candy bar size sequencer. You can yeah. do that for sure. Um, if I, I think you can do your own test at home. It's, you'd need a, a bench and you'd need a centrifuge and you'd need a pipette um, and a kit. You probably don't want to make your own reagents. but it's And it would probably cost you a thousand times as much as getting it from somebody who was a pro. It, it would. It would. So, so, you know, come to Lee or come to me. Uh, we'll get it done um, routinely. Um, and, and be able to help you interpret the results as well. Uh, but the, I think it's an interesting point that science has reached, genetics has reached a point where you can edit the genome and read the genome even in your garage or your kitchen if you want Absolutely. to. Absolutely, yeah. You can take a DNA sequencer out on field tests and look at organisms in the field. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing. What is the most accurate way to measure NAD levels after consumption of precursors? What is your perspective on NAD plus via IV for longevity, similar to what we've done for uh, addiction detoxification? Well, um, for IV NAD, I haven't seen any solid data yet. Uh, I'm aware of it being offered. you know, I went. I went to the one of the hotels in in Hollywood, and they offered it to me at the reception desk, which was funny. But I, and and also, it seems to be helpful, at least anecdotally, with uh, helping with addiction. And there are clinics um, around the country, particularly in Florida. But I, I I can't say as a scientist that I've seen convincing, um, you know, placebo controlled kind of experiments that would tell you if that's working or not. And I, I'm I'm open to it. I, I certainly think it's possible. And if anyone has data that they'd like to share with me, please go ahead and send it to me and I'll, I'll, I'll judge it as I would any other study. Um, go ahead, Lou. Okay, I think we have to close down with the last question I'll ask you, David. I know from our conversation that you're writing another book and I'll offer you a chance to make some comments about it or to decline at this point in time, whichever you choose. <clears throat> right. Well, it's late in the night over here on the East Coast. So, you know, maybe I'm in a talkative mood. But yeah, I'm excited. Uh, the, the first book, Lifespan, was a New York Times bestseller. It was super exciting. I've enjoyed the process. The feedback that I've received um, from you, Lee, and, and many others, but particularly your, your voice was, was very meaningful to me, has prompted me to want to do it again, right? You get enjoyment, you find fulfillment, you do it again. So I am uh, writing another book with my co-author, Matt LaPlante, who's a genius at bringing together a whole bunch of disparate, crazy stuff in my mind. And I know, Lee, you, you work with Matt, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, my new book, uh, we're still not disclosing exactly what it's about, um, but I can tell you that, uh, A, I'm very excited about it. It's going to be as interesting and revolutionary as the first book. Um, we like to take what seems obvious to the world and look at it from behind the mirror and, and actually see what's, what's going on. And it's, a, it's gonna be a journey of understanding where we've come over the last few million years as humans. Why do we exist with, with crazy hands like this? Why do we look like this? Why are we a lollipop physique that's pathetic? You put us in a cage with a chimpanzee and one hit and we're dead. We're pathetic as a species. Why did we evolve genetically to be this pathetic and then what happened to the world that we've made around us? Uh, obviously, we've got technology to try and make our lives easier, to cope with all of the faculties that we've lost over time since we've been out in the wild. But we've built a world that, that, that isn't perfect for our physiology. You know, I'm staring here into lights. I'm not going to sleep well tonight. Uh, you know, we, we, we suffer from social media. We've got a lot of depression and and anxiety in our young kids. Uh, we've got other problems. We sit all day. 
know, time and time again, our technology solves one problem and causes another. Um, and I call this the treadmill that we're on. And really ever, ever, ever since humans have picked up a rock and used it to bang an animal on the head or maybe one of their enemies on the head, we've been on this treadmill. And the question is, can we ever get off? And what does the future hold? And that's what yep. I'm writing about. Yeah. Well, David, I want to thank you for an absolutely stimulating and wonderful conversation. I thought you did a terrific job in bringing the world of aging to, uh, to, to everyone. And I just say a few lessons that I took home when I read your book was something we haven't talked about is that this aging process, David and others have discovered, is conserved all the way back to the simplest of single-celled organisms. And, and I think there are two interests with regard to that conservation. One is it underscores the idea of simplicity and elegance and something that's shared in all creatures. And number two is the idea we can use model organisms like mice and yeast to discover fundamental things that apply in very straightforward fashion to humans. And that's really an exciting idea. I think number two, the idea that aging is a disease and that we really have powerful tools for curing and slowing and even potentially reversing that disease. And I think number three, if we can do that, we can begin to think of a very powerful way for attacking the broad set of chronic diseases whose major predisposing factor is in fact aging itself. And I think finally, with all of the revolutionary changes that David has discovered, in the next 10 years, we're gonna see remarkable opportunities presented to each of us for fundamentally changing our lives and, and presumably moving us into the 80s and 90s and hundreds, physically capable, mentally alert, enthusiastic about life. Now, that poses other really interesting issues about where are we going to get enough money to do all the fun things that we'd like? How can we, uh, are we going to have multiple jobs? All sorts of exciting things. Anyway, I want to thank Town Hall for allowing us to do these wonderful, exciting programs. I think to the audience, please, we'll have other exciting programs in the future uh, that combine together ISP and Town Hall. And if you're interested in keeping up with all of these, go to our website at ISB, which is ISBScience.org. So thank you, and especially you, David. Have a great evening. We really appreciate your contributions, and your expression of them. Well, thank you, Lee. And, and thanks to everybody, uh, the Town Hall folks and everyone who tuned in tonight. I thought it was a wonderful discussion. And Lee, thanks for everything you've done for science and uh, technology as well. Pleasure.